Hello, and welcome to the Inventive Marketing Club. This is number 11, and we're talking about understanding your customer. Um, I'm going to go through a few ways so that we can better fulfill our customers' needs to target our products more effectively. Um, okay, next. So um, if you're new to the club, you've not been before, it's really um, all about a, a keeping up momentum with your marketing. I mean, that's one of the core things I found with marketing over certainly the nine, 10 years I've been running in this business, that if you can do something regularly, um, you can really build up that momentum, whether it's in email marketing, social, um, or on your website, blogging. Um, anything you can do with regularity is uh, a benefit because you will build up that momentum. And that's one of the aims for this particular club. Um, it also is going to just give you energy. You're going to get new ideas just by listening to what, what we're talking about. Uh, you get the opportunity to ask questions. You're part of a friendly community. Um, we've got a new clubhouse now, which I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, you get to um, participate in the conversations going on there. Plus, if you've got any technical questions, you, you feel free to ask them because it's something I can go through in the Q&A at the uh, end. So uh, if you're not part of the club and you want to join, um, do let me know afterwards, get in touch, uh, hello at ratherinventive.com, or I may share a link as well to join. Next, um, as I said, we've got a new clubhouse. Um, now, this is a base camp project. For those of you who already work with me, you'll know what that is. Um, for those who don't, it's a really useful project management tool. And in there, I'm putting every previous webinar that I've done, and we'll be keeping that up to date as we go. So after this recording, once we've got access to it, we'll make sure that goes up um, onto, uh, onto Basecamp, into our clubhouse. I'm also putting in there tools, apps, and other resources that I use or that have been recommended to me um, as um, a port of call, really. It, it, it's a list I've been creating for myself, but I'm sharing that with you. Um, it's like a favourites list of all, all the useful tools I've found. Let me just quickly flick through it for you if you've not seen it yet. So um, you may have been introduced with a message, a read me first message, just giving you a little a bit of an example of some of the things that you want to be looking at, such as making sure you're registered on a webinar. Obviously, if you're seeing this, then you are, which is great. Um, getting access to our back catalogue or just, uh, just chatting to some of the members that are already part of the community. Um, in the docs and files section, we've got the club webinars, all uh, 10 of them at the moment. Um, any workshops that I do where I've got relevant handouts that we haven't covered with in the uh, as a club webinar, I'll be putting up in workshop handouts as well. There's some oddballs in there, but there may be other things that will be interesting to you. I've also got a marketing checklist, and that's uh, basically a list through from newbie to pro, uh, reasonably pro marketer, taking you through all the different things that you should be doing. Again, it might inspire you or, in or engage you to... Um, to start doing different things in marketing, and then all the tools and apps resources that I've spoken about. So let's quickly flick through those. Here are all the cl club webinars. We've actually done quite a lot this year. We're on number 11 now, it'll be 12. Um, I, I think certainly I've come a long way in terms of developing these webinars, and hopefully you're finding them useful as we go. Then the tools, apps, and resources. I've tried to break this list down into different categories, so to make it easier to find. But if you want to find uh, any particular piece of information, you'll notice there's a find link at the top on the top right. Click on that, just type in a few keywords and it's going to bring up the relevant resource for you. OK, um, as with all the questions, uh, I, I will pose different questions as I go along and I'll answer them when I can. Um, sorry, you answer them when you can uh, and I'll review at the end or vice versa. You know, if you've got a question, just just pose it uh, and I'll get to it when I can. Okay, so customer needs. This is such a big world in terms of what we could talk about. So I'm, I'm trying to really focus on two, two different areas or two different ways that you can focus on, on customer need. Um, but there are basically lots of different ways of trying to um, marry up the problems that your customer has and the solutions that your product solves. So the two ways I'm looking at is just looking at the problem itself. Um, and the other one is looking at the life goal. So what ultimately is your customer trying to do? Uh, and I'll go through some more in-depth examples of that. But first, let's look at the problem. So if we want to solve the problem, we need to look at what pain points the customer is coming up against and why, why are they motivated to buy a new product, to change their service. And it's usually, in this case, when we're looking at it in this detail, is to overcome a pain point. Now, here are some examples. So if you're hungry, then 
your pain is quite physical and you need food. So that's one way that we'll address that. If you've got back pain, then maybe a way of addressing that problem is to take medication. Um, it won't necessarily get rid of the back pain, but it will make the problem go away. And so that, um, and this is where we start coming into why we maybe don't want to be looking at it this way or, or where it's quite a simplistic way of looking at um, customer products. Another one is that a customer wants a 10 millimeter hole. Um, now at the moment, we don't know whether that's a DIYer or a big industry person, but basically we could fulfill that need with a, a drill, a, a laser cutter, a punch. There's so many different ways of creating a, a hole. Um, but basically the pain is a hole. I need a hole in a wall or a hole in a piece of metal or a hole in a board. And there's different ways of solving that problem. Um, the other, the other one here is uh, maybe something that's slightly more intangible, but they want more social engagement. So that might be something a customer, a potential customer come, comes and talks to me and say, I want more engagement with my customers or potential customers, or I want more people to like my posts on social media. Why aren't they liking my posts? And so maybe the answer is, oh, you need more interesting posts. So let's just tackle that problem. Let's make your posts more interesting. Let's get you more followers. And then maybe the right followers will give you that sort of engagement. Um, or maybe some video. I know that video works really well. It's very, it's very easy to consume and, um, uh, and access. So maybe video is, is what they need there. So really each one of those is looking at a particular problem that someone faces and how we might address that with a product. So obviously if you're a company that makes medication, then really, uh, that might be all, all you're looking at is um, how can I solve that problem through medication or um, as a social media trainer, it might be, well, they just want more social engagement. So I'm going to help them get more social engagement through what I know. Um, so this is a common way to look at things really in terms of breaking up your customers and, and understanding your customer better is to think about what problems they have. And I think it can work quite well. It can take you quite a long way. Certainly, I advocate if you're just starting off to, to really just think about the core problems that your, your customers face and look at whether your, your product addresses that. Another way to look at it, and maybe more fruitful, is to support a life goal. Now, this life goal doesn't necessarily have to be something like, I want to... Um, live a comfortable life, not worry about money, go on the holidays I want to go to, support charities where I can, and X, Y, and Z. You don't necessarily need to think as big as that, and certainly I don't know if all companies can support that sort of life goal, but it is better to think about um, how people want to be um, in the future. So something I want to be more of now is healthier. So there are various different ways I can look at that. I can, I can just take uh, supplements maybe for nutrition that I'm missing, or I could eat better food. Um, maybe healthier to me means actually I need to, um, uh, I need to take more exercise, but they're all things I want to be. Um, if we're looking at just the problems that you're solving, it could be, maybe I'm not sleeping so well at night. So, um, there are two ways of dealing with that. I could take drugs, I could just tackle the problem of sleeping at night, or maybe I could attack, attack the, the bigger issue of changing my um, whole approach so that I'm fitter, healthier, maybe take more exercise, and you sleep better at night. But really, what this angle of looking at your customer need is all about moving someone from where they are now to where they want to be. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, one, one way of thinking about this, and I've mentioned it to a few uh, clients already, is jobs to be done. Uh, now, initially, when if you were to search for jobs to be done online, uh, on Google, it's, it can be a bit confounding as to what it actually means. But essentially, yeah, it is moving someone from where they want to be, uh, from where they are to where they want to be. And, and here's a quote I pulled from, uh, there's lots of resources online about jobs to be done, or the idea of jobs to be done. And here's the quote is, your effort should focus on helping them, the customer, make that change. So ideally, the co consumer or customer wouldn't have to do any work. So that's interesting as well. So your job, when you devise your product or service, is to help cus customer move from A to B. 
where do they want to get to and how can our product help them do that? And it may be that our product ultimately needs to change so they do less work. There's a good example, a good picture, which I'll, I'll show you later on. Um, here's a nice illustration that uh, shows what that means, really. So looking at uh, from the jobs to be done angle, you've got the customer of where they are now. So uh, I think this is an example of coaching. So they're not sure what to do. They lack confidence. There's different advice out there, maybe on YouTube or their own blogs, and they feel like a failure. But they know what they want is they know where they want to be. They want a clear direction for their life. Uh, they want to be inspired and motivated and wake up fresh um, and maybe have someone they can confide in and someone who, who can support them. Now, there's so many different ways you could achieve that move in someone. And it might be that one company can tackle all of them. And they've given some examples there. So video chat with a famous person. I mean, there's lots of uh, personal coaches online who might be able to do this. Maybe a book will do the job. There'll just be a few tidbits in there that will just push people forwards. Uh, attending a conference, so you're enthused by being around lots of other people. Hiring a consultant, maybe you feel that you need more one-to-one -one specific advice for you and you, you, you don't want to share it with other people and you, you feel more, more motivated to work with someone else. So there's lots of different ways that you could achieve that. But if you're a company that can help them either achieve through one of those ways or maybe that whole vertical, then you're, you, you're more likely to succeed because you're aligned with their goals. You know what they want to achieve and you're trying to do that with, on their behalf. So this is an idea called Jobs To Be Done, and it's sort of been brewing for quite some time, really. Um, I will give you some resources that will be worth reading, although it's quite a lot, so um, it may not be something that you want to dive into. But there is a really good interview where the guy who sort of helped develop this Jobs To Be Done concept talks to, um, he's actually an analyst, about his purchase of a recent car. And it's a really good way of showing how you might um, find out exactly why your customers bought from you. Because you may not know exactly what their life goals are. You may have lots of customers, but not really know why they buy from you. And so that's a good way to see how that works uh, and actually come up with some of the real answers as to why people want uh, a new car or a new product. Um, I think there was one simple example is uh, impulse purchases at a till. So maybe you've got some chocolates there. Um, well, the impulse purchases may be that you are hungry while you're shopping. So you're buying something to eat right now. It may be that you just don't feel motivated enough and that you, you've got your go-to snack that actually is just in front of you and you can buy that. Um, now, there may be nothing wrong with that, but if it's chocolate and sugar, that's not terribly great for our bodies. Uh, I've noticed little do the same thing when we've been in there, but they actually have fruit, um, nuts and maybe dry fruit, which is a little bit better, but still impulse purchases. Um, but the thing is, it's not that someone has just decided to buy that, um, those, that bag of nuts, that Mars bar or, or whatever it might be. There is a reason they're buying that. Um, and that is a, a bigger reason than just being there at the aisle at the time. It just happens that that chocolate bar is there. Anyway, I'll move on. So um, an example which is similar to solving the problem is to solve a life goal. So the life goal may be, and it's very simple, is you don't want to be hungry. Well, maybe you still need food. Um, you could look at it that if you have money, you're willing, rather than for you to go out and hunt for food, that you can go and buy food. Um, it may be there's different types of food you want. It might be that actually you're not, you don't really like eating, but you still not want to be, you don't want to be hungry. So maybe a soup or a protein drink would be better for you. Um, more of a life goal, and I've changed a lot of these into more life goals rather than solving problems. But you want to be fit and healthy. Maybe as part of that, you have back pain. Certainly I did, um, I think this was back when I lived in Hereford. I, I got back pain, I had shooting pains running down me, and I go to see the physio and say, what's happening to me? What's happening to my body? Um, so it starts with the pain, but then actually you've got a life goal. You say, well, I need to change what I'm doing. I'm just sat down too much. My, my job is too sedentary. Um, um, I'm not moving around enough. And so I could just take medication to sort that out, and that would relieve some of it. I could maybe have a better posture while I'm sitting down. But actually, the best course of action is to have a healthier diet. 
is to move more and uh, walking around. I do kickboxing now, so exercise as well. And actually, doing that strengthens your core so that you don't get back pain so much. I now stand up. This is not, uh, I've got a standing desk, so um, I'm stood up much of the time. So that saves having that problem of bit being bending your back. So, so all of those sort of things, starting off with a pain, but then actually that causes a life goal change. And actually, if people come to you and want to support that life goal change, rather than just solving those individual problems, one, you've probably got a customer who will stay with you a lot longer. But also, there may be many different products and services you can supply to them in that chain. Um, I know with a physio, I went to see them as part of the NHS initially. So there's that sort of more consultative V. But then he also had a, um, a Pilates class that ran every week regularly. So the nice thing about that would be that um, we have this more intense uh, restorative work where he can show me what to do, uh, sort of diagnose the problem, show me what to do, and then I can start helping myself. And then coming along to the, 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 the actual classes, which, which means he can still get money for a longer period of time, and I'm still a bit feeling supported and working towards my goal, which is not to, have, uh, to feel healthy and not have back pain ultimately. It could be that if you want that uh, 10 millimeter hole, actually what you want is to sell more widgets with holes. So you need a better way of drilling them, a cleaner way of drilling them. Maybe when you drill those holes, it, um, you don't just want the hole, but it burrs on there. So you've got to clean it as well. So maybe you need a, a better, sharper tool to do that with. Um, maybe you don't even want to do work. So remember in Jobs To Be Done, it says how you can move people from where they are to where they want to be. And the idea there is that they may not even want to do any work. So if you can take that work away from them, that might be even better. So it could be that uh, you want holes drilled, but actually you don't need to drill them. So you don't need to buy a drill. You can get a contractor to do it. And so it doesn't actually matter how they drill the hole, as long as when the widget with the hole comes back to you, it's to the quality level that you want. It may be that you could automate it so that you take the whole process in-house, but you've got, got a much more automated process. So here I've got one of Cellmax, uh, I think it's a plasma CNC machine, and it may be that investing in that plasma machine means you can create those widgets with holes much faster, much more cheaply, and, and you can sell more of them. So it's worth that investment. So if you, it really does depend on A, what product you have, but also if you're thinking about what people want to achieve, maybe you could help them better. Maybe with Cellmac, they don't sell them a machine. They lease them a machine over a period of time because they're supporting that goal. They can make that, they can be changing and updating and upgrading that machine as they go. It may be that Cellmac say, actually, you don't need to buy a machine from us. You can just use our facility. You give us the, the diagrams, the programming, and we'll make that widget for you. I'm not saying they should, but there's lots of different ways you can approach that same issue if you're looking to what the end goal is. Um, another one could be a company just wants more leads. So they want more leads. Why do they want more leads? Well, they just want to have a bit more profit so they can maybe have some nice holidays or buy a new car or any of these other life goals they want to achieve. We can bring them back to why they want more leads. And so it could be that they need a more focused sales strategy. Uh, maybe they just need to be out more. Maybe they need a more focused sales strategy. Maybe they need a sales team who can do that for them. Maybe they need to outsource it. It doesn't actually really matter. As long as you're supporting the life goal, there's so many different ways you can solve that problem. And this is something I come up against all the time in terms of what we do. There's so many different ways I can solve the problem of people needing more leads, profit, um, a better lifestyle balance. Um, you know, I can either provide that through coaching support where I teach people how to do it, a bit like this, or I can provide it through direct support, working one-to-one, -one, or I can provide it through... Um, outsourcing, where we just handle it for you. So if it's just a case of you needing more leads or you needing um, uh, more, vid more um, I was going to say video work, but not, you know, you don't even need to worry about how you get the leads. It could be something you give that problem to work for someone else with a target, with a cost goal. And as long as they're meeting that, you're actually better off. So I guess the idea behind this is just to think about how you support moving your customers from one place to another before you look at how you solve those individual problems, because I really feel that those problems are sort of further down the line. I hope that makes sense.
One of the images on Jobs To Be Done, which I present here, is quite funny, is about a lawnmower. And it's given the examples here, really, in a more visual form, of how you might move someone who is fed up of doing mowing. So, yeah, you can do it yourself. But actually, you're going to be fed up of doing it. You could get in contractors to do it for you. So um, you're not having to do the work, but it still gets done. Now, obviously, there's a cost benefit analysis. And how much do you value your time? Maybe you like mowing the lawn. It's your sort of quiet time, sort of march up and down the garden. Maybe that's how you get exercise. In which case, if you like that, like me, trying to contract out that gardening work, or certainly mowing the lawn, is not going to work because you're not supporting my life goal. If I hated mowing and I didn't want to do mowing again, but it needs to be done, and I want to enjoy my garden and spend time in my garden, then maybe contracting out is the best way forward. I know something my brother has gone for is the automated approach. So he's, uh, he's got an automated lawn mower, which will, every, every time it detects it's dry enough, off it goes around the lawn, nibbling away, almost like a little sheep would. Um, that takes care of the problem, but it's in his control. So he's contracted out uh, the, the role of uh, mowing his lawn to a robot. And that works quite well too. Um, people might like that because there is a some amount of ownership, but you've got a big upfront investment. Um, maybe it doesn't do it quite as well as contractors. But again, you've got to make sure you're aligning with someone's life goal. Someone like my brother likes technology. That sort of thing is his, his style. So it really aligns with where he wants to be and how he feels he wants to live. Or it could be that you want the um, you want uh, a lawn, but you really just want it to be looked after. So maybe you can get some sort of fake astroturf, uh, or fake grass or something like that. So it gives all of the pleasures and benefits and effect of grass, but without needing to be cut, weeded and so on and treated. So there's lots of different ways of looking at it. So another quote from Jobs to be done, and hopefully this crystallizes a little bit, but it's like when we buy a product, we essentially hire it to help us do that job. And they do talk a, a lot about that in Jobs to be done, hiring something, whether it's a person, a product or service to do a job. And that job is that transition between where you are and where you want to be. Um, and I, I guess goes, it makes it slightly difficult for people because people think of a job as a thing, it's a thing that needs doing, but it's actually bigger than that. The, the job is much more of a lifestyle change from one place to another. So as long as you can understand that, the whole thing makes sense. So when we buy a product, we essentially hire it to help us do the job. And if it does well, the next time we're confronted with the same job, we tend to hire that product again. Um, and that product, here's another example of that, could be, um, I think this was uh, with McDonald's, um, where people were asking, they wanted to increase the sales of milkshakes. And they were asking people, why do you like milkshakes? Well, I like strawberry or um, I like the flavor or, 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 or it reminds me of childhood, that sort of thing. But that doesn't really help you understand why people are buying it um, until they started drilling into it a little bit more. And they found out that people were buying uh, the milkshake because they wanted a drink that lasted them on their commute. That was something that would be slow to drink um, or consume, that would keep them occupied and, um, and not bored during their commute. So a uh, sugary, uh, cold, ice creamy type, drinky, slurpy thing fitted that bill. You could obviously replace that with a podcast. That would keep you entertained for that, that journey. A coffee, that's something. Podcast and a coffee, actually perfect combination for me. Um, but it doesn't really matter. But understanding that people use it for that purpose means that you can, if you're certainly advertising, you can illustrate it in that way because you really understand how people use it. Maybe while people are driving, you can have uh, the billboards um, in their uh, in their light eyesight. So it will remind them about, about that sort of thing. Not that I'm, I'm recommending uh, McDonald's um, milkshakes, but. That was a, a case study that I think they went through and came up with the same thing. In fact, there is a really good uh, article that I'll share at the end in references where they do talk through lots of different case studies like this. And I think it's definitely worth reading through those. They may or may not apply directly to your business, but I think it's worth looking at because it gives you a really good understanding for how you deeply understand the need of a customer and why they want to do something. Because if you can do that, you can, you can better frame your product.
Okay, so to continue with the quote. So if the job, do, if it does the job well, the next time we're confronted with the same job, we tend to hire it again. So you keep drinking those milkshakes. And if it does a crummy job, we fire it and look for an alternative. And that's where, if you want to maybe beat the competition, is you find um, or you, you um, alter your product to fit their job better than the competition. Um, you can look at something like the iPhone as a good way of doing this. That actually the iPhone's job is many things to different people, but one of them may be communicating with other people. One of them may be being their only camera. One of them may be, um, you know, being sort of a, uh, being able to carry their documents and files with them. Or um, in my case, it's uh, having a video camera and microphone all built into one. So there's lots of different reasons and life goals that can make that device useful. And that's one of the reasons it won out over many others. It's not just because of its um, nice, simple touch interface, but because it combined all of these different wants and needs and, and life goals from people into one device and did it well. I mean, that's something I haven't really said throughout all of this. You can understand what a customer wants, but if you don't fully... Um, if you don't build the quality in, then it's not going to work for you. You're going to find it very difficult or someone else is going to come and do it better. OK, so this is a good quote, product, uh, a good quote. But it basically it, it is essentially saying that if you can get this right, then people are going to keep hiring for the job until you don't or until there's no, uh, another alternative. So a question I'm going to pose is why do your customers hire you? What is, what is it about what you do to help your customers, and if you think of it from a life goal point of view, what are you really helping them do? I want to know that. So um, just let me know in the chat, uh, and I'll see if we can get back to that later. And also, if you've got time, why do you hire IMC? I mean, some of you may be customers, so you've already, um, I sort of, I've, I've pushed you into IMC thinking it, you know, it will be useful for you, but other people have come in from other sources. So I, I'm interested to know um, what value this provides to you. Uh, good, good market research for us, if nothing else. So let's take those ideas and sort of build them into something actionable. Let's uh, sort of walk through how you might um, um, build up a, a bit more of a customer profile. Uh, what I would say is just start simply. Um, don't worry about trying to understand the full life cycle of what your customer is trying to do. I think the very uh, simple, simpler that you can start and you can work on your customer profile and develop and evolve it, the better. So I'll start with Alex. And um, I, don't, I don't think Alex is watching today. He, he's um, often not able to make, to make these, but I'll, I often use Alex in my um, workshop. So I'm gonna use him here today. Now, Alex, this is Alex Kopok and he's an architect um, and I sort of, the way I think about Alex, uh, in a sort of, if I boil it down, I, I want to find more people like Alex because I like working with Alex. And if I can find more people like him, then you know we want we all want to find better and nicer customers to work with. Um, so we want to find more people of the people we do like. So Alex, if I boil it down into five words, he's a passionate professional, and what that means is he really not only enjoys what he does, but he's passionate about it. It just comes out. He's enthusiastic. And he's a professional because he's um, either qualified at what he does or he's doing something in a, in a professional way. Um, uh, other clients we worked in are like that are vets. So they're passionate about what they do, passionate about looking after animals or their, or their, uh, their owners, um, serving their owners. But they, they're professionals, so they do something in a, um, uh, a professional way, a quality way. Um, he's also a Mac user, uh, and that to me just symbolises someone who's willing to pay for quality, uh, like themselves really. And people hiring Alex are willing to pay for someone who's just going to give them that much more attention and quality. And I've put 40 there. Uh, things have moved on a little bit, bit now, but um, I'm a little bit older than 40, but not much. Um, but I put the age in there because for me it's relevant that people are around my age, usually maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger. If they're too young, then they tend to be able to go and do it themselves because it's something they can do. You know, they'll go on social media. They know how to Instagram or, or, or use video. So there's an element of that. And, and often younger people are um, time rich and uh, poor in cash. Whereas um, the older you get, I don't know if anyone else finds this, but the older you get, you tend to have uh, less 
free time, let's put it that way, um, but slightly more money available. You're willing to contract things out. So the way I sort of encapsulate and crystallise how I think feel about Alex and people like him is he's a passionate professional. He's a Mac user and he's 40. Uh, the other thing for me that's crucially important and very difficult to work with if I don't have it is, is that passion. Um, if, if, if I don't have someone who really oozes their product and is part of it and their service, that's really difficult to market, especially in video. So what I'd like you to do is the same thing. Just have a think about describing your customer in five words. This is like the first part of building up a persona because it's a good place to start. It's easier because it's only five words, but actually it can be quite tricky because you might be able to like write down lots of words that describe your customer. But A, you've got to think of a customer that you really like, you get on with, they pay well. Um, you'd want them recommending you to other customers and so on. So really think about someone like that, that you know that already works with you and try and boil that down to five words. And if you've got time, do put it in the chat. I'd love to see those later. So once you've moved on from that, and that's something good, to, that's just gonna give you a, a good way to start. What I next want you to do is look at your customer and product fit. Um, you know, we wanna go and look at the customer's goals, what are they trying to achieve, not just what their problems are, but what are they trying to achieve? And then we want to fit our product to how we can achieve those goals. How can our product service um, help them do what they want to do? So I've got a sort of worked example of this. So on the left hand side, we've got customer goals. And we've got a few items underneath. Um, and I, I could actually attribute these to me a little bit. So want to lose a little bit of weight, just a little bit. Flatter stomach maybe. So they just want to lose a little bit of weight. They want to feel healthier and meet new friends. I think actually um, uh, being mentally healthy is important as well because that can affect your whole body and meeting new friends or meeting regularly with friends, people you enjoy talking to or sharing with is a very um, mentally healthy way of being. So maybe customer's goal is they want to lose weight. That's the initial pain maybe they just feel a little bit, uh, a little bit fat. Um, they want to feel healthier and they want to meet new friends. Well, actually you could solve those in different ways. So as the product team, you could uh, maybe to lose weight, you can match that with a simple diet, not a fad, not something clever, but a simple diet where you eat good calories and you eat fewer of them than you, um, than you use. So, or, or it's balanced. So you can lose weight initially, but then it becomes sustainable. You're not trying to miss out food you really like. You're just trying to move yourself from a place where you eat too much to just eating better food that keeps you fuller for longer. Um, you want to feel healthier. Maybe that's an exercise plan. I've really found personally myself that um, having exercise releases these uh, endorphins I think they're called and you feel better by doing that and over the long term you can feel healthier so actually developing an exercise plan could work to, to do that um, and meeting new friends actually maybe you can combine if you're a coach who's doing this you can provide your simple diet plan and exercise plan but you can have regular group meetups where people can come and share how they're feeling they can come and share tips um, and just get that boost from a community that is very difficult to get in other ways. And so all I've done here is just thinking about what your customer wants to achieve, and they don't need to be necessarily life goals. They can be quite small, um, like the ones we've got here. But thinking about what they want to achieve and then how your product or service can meet those. It may be that the product you offer actually only meets a small amount of that, and there are more um, services that you could layer on top of that. It could be that maybe you just have a simple diet plan. You've got a, a cookery book that has a, just a really nice array of meals that are healthy, nutritious, and um, keep you full all day. Maybe you want to partner up with someone who can provide the exercise plan as part of that. Um, maybe they could combine the, um, the meals with the exercise plan as a video. 
Um, and then the group meetups, maybe that's not something you can do physically, but it might be something where you can outsource that to someone else, or you could find another partner who's doing that already and sort of bring them in. So they're already managing these group meetups and uh, you can be part of that process. So it may be that your product or your company isn't doing the whole life cycle for people, but you can work with other partners to do that. However, if you can, if there is a way that you can take that whole vertical of the customer wanting to lose weight, feel healthy and meet new friends, and you can deliver that all on the same side, uh, on the other side of and your product, um, then not only is the customer going to find that easier because you can take ownership of all of that in terms of supporting them, but also you're going to make, um, hopefully, a margin on each one of those different products. So you're going to be able to take um, extract more value from the customer if we look at it in a very um, mercenary way but you're able to get more money out of people and I think that will come willingly you can look at uh, like them or love them you can look at an example like Apple I mean they've um, for a long time just been known as a computer company then they branch out into consumer electronics and now more recently they're branching out into services well they have been branching out into services over the last few years now they're moving into media so they've got games that they're, um, they're a publisher, basically, publishing games. They're publishing TV and movies. Um, they're able to supply you music. And ultimately, at some point, what Apple wants to be, to some degree, is be able to not only provide you with the device that you consume all of this on, but to be able to provide you with all the media as well on there. Not only does providing you with the media enrich that device, but also it gives them more profit because they're able to eat a little bit of margin out of all of that. It gives you another reason to use that device because maybe their content is exclusive only to that. It provides more lock-in, maybe with iCloud, you've got all your photos in there, you've got all your stories, and it's just a bit more difficult to move. Um, not that you should think about locking your customer in, but having having that sort of nice lock-in, what they call sort of like a golden, uh, golden handcuffs or golden prison, um, People can people like that when a company can take or someone can take full ownership for all of the, the life goals that they want to achieve. Um, it's very similar to a lot of clients who maybe sell a product, but they can also provide the consultancy and the installation and the aftercare as well. Because you're taking away that whole problem. You can not only recommend what CCTV system gets installed, but you can um, provide that product at a good price. Um, you can install that product for them so they know it's done to your satisfaction and then you can support it for them as well. And they know if there's any problems, they've got one person to go to rather than managing all of that separately. So as long as you understand that life goal, you can really help not only serve that customer better, maybe get a better opportunity for them to buy from you, but there are, you are in doing so, you're creating more potential products to sell. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> So some other things you can look at, and I think that first stage is good, marrying up your customer to what your product is. And if you need to, change your product to fit your customer. But once you've done that, you need to get some practical steps, really, um, in order to help refine that a bit more and start the marketing process. So the first um, area of that is awareness. Um, so you've got to understand how customers describe your product. What words are they using to describe it? What problem... Um, Maybe what problems are you solving directly? This is where you can start drilling down a little bit. Where do they look for recommendations? Is it with friends? Is it online? Do they read magazines? Do they watch YouTube videos? Where is it that they're most influenced by? Maybe putting in your backstory. Is there any element of your backstory that helps support this longer term goal that they want to achieve or specific pain points? And also, why should they care? You know, what is it about what you do that they really care about? Um, I was just doing a workshop this morning on email marketing and uh, we actually were talking about webinars and how some webinars are boring and uninteresting and uh, maybe people turn off when they can start seeing the sales pitches coming in. Hopefully mine are not like that but do tell me if they are. But some of webinars or videos that I've been on, if they're done well, you want them to tell you about the product and you're like, oh, that sounds amazing. Everything you're talking about just clicks, click, 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 click. That just aligns fully for what I want to achieve. Tell me what I need to do. And if you can get to that point, great. And so that's all the awareness stage really is 
Um, what you're doing online, whether it's YouTube, webinars, email, social media, blog posts, organic, Google, doesn't matter. What you're doing online, that's all the awareness stage. It's getting people who don't know you to know you and hopefully uh, the people who, who align their life goal with what, what you're trying to achieve or, or help them with. And then you come to the consideration phase. So this is where people maybe have, um, they've seen something you've done online and they're reading your landing page, learning a bit more about your product, or they're coming through to the webinar and they are understanding a bit more about how you can help them achieve what they want to achieve. So you've got this consideration phase and this is quite important. It may be that they, you're lucky enough to get that lead and they buy straight away. But more than often than not, it's gonna be they're bouncing to and from your brand until they ultimately make a decision to move forward and buy. So some of the things you might want to think about in this phase are what do they know already? How will they compare us? You know, are there any issues where they're going to have um, negative feelings towards something or they're going to have um, certain objections that need to be overcome? Or at least they've got an objection and you need to talk about that objection so that they know that you understand where they're coming from, um, how long the process takes and um, any specific questions. This can be really good in terms of starting getting to the detail FAQs and that sort of stuff. So consideration phase. And I see that as after the first touch or connection with you all the way through until they start making a decision. Then the last part of that, the decision phase. So this is where we start. Once they've added that item to their cart, what do they need to know to make a decision? Price, delivery, returns. Are you really ticking all those boxes to make sure they feel comfortable, safe and satisfied? that You're going to do what you say you're going to do. Um, if it's uh, more of a long term sales pitch, who will make the decision? Is it the person you're talking to or do you need to bring someone else in? How do they buy from us? Can you make it easy? Um, or what can you do to make it easy? Can you outline the process in advance? Can you explain it in video? Um, there's definitely ways I know that I could make that process more easy or easier by explaining it in detail a bit more. So awareness, consideration, decision. Once you've gone through aligning your customer needs or their life goals with what your product or service can do. Uh, now I'm going to take a small diversion because I think it's interesting. Um, and this is taken from a presentation um, that I did a little while ago, written uh, based on a blog post actually written by Louise. And it's all about choice. And there's some elements and things in here that I thought would resonate well when understanding the customer and how we can understand how most people really give the customer too much choice. And I think, you know, when we're talking about what their needs are, if we can just simply align their needs with a few products and keep that choice small, it's going to make things a lot easier for us. Um, so I think uh, people are addicted to choice. They broadly see it as a good thing. Uh, it's definitely taken to some extremes. Here's an example of that. Um, and I updated these figures uh, actually last night, so they're completely fresh. So if you search waitrose.com for cheese, there were 564 results found. Um, I think that was up from 400 odd. Um, of those, if I refined it to cheddar cheese as 136, it was 108. And actually when I did it before, well, when was this, 2017? Um, it was 94 at the time. So it's jumped up. There's a lot, many more cheese products. You can choose from mild, mature, um, farmhouse, extra mature, vintage, and so on. Um, I think with vintage, uh, there's 10 products. But believe it or not, in 2017, there were 34 vintage cheeses, which is crazy. Um, and a little factoid here, the most expensive uh, on Waitrose was uh, number one roll right at £29.50 per kilogram. Can you believe it? Um, and I think the problem with choice, certainly for me, but I think other people feel this too, is what if I made the wrong choice? You get this anxiety. Maybe there's a better option. So I go and look on other sites, Tesco, um, uh, not Aldi and Little, you don't really search online, but Asda. What if I made the wrong decision? Um, because of the internet, I'm able to research all these options endlessly. You bounce from um, Google to Amazon to eBay, and it's like, ah, I just want the right solution. So how do we cope with this? So there's dozens of prices, sizes, features. You've got opinions from friends, magazines, podcasts even. Um, takes a lot of mental energy. Certainly I know from <laughs> buying a car, we're looking at buying a car at the moment. Uh, I mean, ref 
if at all when you're buying a car you need to refine down your list of options because um if you don't do that then it's endless you know you need to put a cap on how far you're willing to go what the, what the upper price limit is do you want bluetooth or not what what even manufactured what type of car um maybe i think about these things too much but i think it's important if you want to reduce that choice anxiety you definitely want to do that but it takes a lot of mental energy and you can get this decision overload um and when that happens you differentiate on price because that's all you've got to go on if there's nothing else you can differentiate on if you're just completely confused you might just go for the cheapest option and as we know that's not often the best thing um for, for me this is a personal example i think restaurants are the worst or this is where i feel most choice anxiety um you get given a large menu and you fold out, maybe fold out a couple of times more. Plus a specials board over there, which you've got to go and look at. And I love food. And if you've got a choice like that, where you can eat uh, anything on this menu, it's so difficult in terms of knowing what to eat. Now, I'm not a fussy eater, so maybe that's the problem. If I was a fussy eater, there would only be a few things to eat. So what ends up happening is I sit there for the first 10 minutes not, not deciding. Maybe everyone's chatting at the table anyway. You're out with a group of friends or your kids and you, you spend time doing everything else to avoid the problem uh, that you've got of making a decision. Uh, and then after, me, after the meal, you've got unlimited coffee choices or, or desserts. And, um, and this is all because the decisions are left unmade by the designer um, and designer of any product. In this case, it's the chef or the restaurant owner. And actually, if anyone has watched any of uh, Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares, what is the key thing that he does every single time that is one of the reasons that they're more successful? Is he gets rid of their menu and gives it a much slimmer choice. And it's usually a couple of starters, a couple of mains, a couple of puddings. And that's it. Keep it simple. By reducing that choice down, you make it easier for your customer. Um... You know, we, we need to think about what our customers want. If we know what their life goals are, we can start making those choices for them. Apple, I, I think, do this pretty well. Sometimes they don't give us enough options, but generally speaking, they set the defaults up correctly. So when you first use one of their products, the defaults are how most people want it. And then depending on what you've bought, you can then refine things as you want, which is fine for the people who want to do that. Um, so reducing that choice uh, will help reduce the anxiety and increase the throughput. It just means that you can get more, you don't have that wasted time. You don't, you have a, a shorter consideration cycle. Maybe you can get more covers in your restaurant because people are, are through more quickly and still feeling happy for that. Uh, here's a good example of a restaurant I think does it well, but bear in mind, this was done certainly uh, two to three years ago when I looked at this. And I know that they have changed their menu since since this time. However, when I went, the, the idea was really good. So this was a vegetarian curry house in Bristol. Don't let the vegetarian put you off. It's just the idea we're looking at here. Um, although the curries were really nice. So what I liked about this place is it had two set meal times. One of the most frustrating things is having to choose a blooming time to eat. Now you can choose different times. Maybe it's 6.20, 6.30, 7.15. Um, You've got all these different times. And the problem with that is I have to make another bloody choice. And I don't want that. And that's even before I'm at the restaurant. For me, this was really nice that they had two times. I think one was seven o'clock, one, one setting was seven o'clock and one was nine o'clock. The good thing about that is, you know how many covers you've got. You've got a session. People have two hours, which is plenty of time for most people to eat a meal, have a good time and then move on. Um, and you know you've got those two sessions. You don't have to manage, um, you manage bookings, but you don't have to manage these individual times. And maybe you get someone who comes at an odd time and that actually could block two covers um, in that table for you and that reduces throughput. So they got two set meal times. They had two set menus, as in there were two different courses that you could have. You can either have one option or another option and then one fixed price for it. Nice and easy. You go in there and if you want a simple decision to be made, you're done, done, done. And then if you want to add on some extra bits, maybe there are a couple of sides you can buy if you want, or maybe a beer or fizzy water. You can add on a few extra bits, but they're add-ons. You don't feel you need to make that decision before you um, 
before you um, get get eating. Make it easy for people. Make it simple. Um, yeah, I recommend if anyone's uh, to check out the Tali restaurant. It was really really nice experience when I went there. Um, so yeah, keeping things simple is uh, another way uh, that you can use choice to your advantage. There was an experiment. Uh, I haven't got a link to this. My apologies. I'll see if I can find it. But there's an experiment with two beers. And out of, um, if you gave the choice of two beers to people, then 80% would choose the most expensive and 20% would choose the least expensive. Okay. So reducing choice is good, you think. But actually, if you add a third option, what happens is 80% choose the middle one and 20% choose the most expensive. No one buys the cheapest. Generally speaking, it might be different in, in what you do, but no one buys the cheapest. And what you're able to do then is rather, rather than having a cheap and an expensive, you might be able to move people up that price ladder by still having the cheap and expensive, but you put the middle one in. And now the 20% who chose the cheap one are choosing the middle one. So they pay a little bit more for something because they don't want the cheapest. No, few people want the cheapest. Most people want the middle option. Some people will always go for the higher priced option just because they can. So I would experiment if you don't have already, have three options for people because you're giving them a little bit of choice, but not too much. So maybe having, don't worry about choice too much. Uh, certainly for me, seeking the perfect choice is not only a recipe for misery, but more than likely does not actually exist. And that's a quote from Barry Schwartz. I think I've said that right, from his book, The Paradox of Choice. There is no perfect choice, so don't beat yourself up about it. But I find myself doing that every single restaurant I go to. I've got to stop. So hopefully that was a nice little diversion. Um, while it's not directly related to knowing more about the customer, I think if you do know more about your customer's goal, you can then help them get there more quickly by keeping the options focused and slim. Um, this is something I heard uh, from a coach I used to work with, Simon uh, Williams from Amaravista, um, where um, one of the, the what, something that came up was basically you don't want people to get into a state where they don't make a decision. It's bad for you and it's bad for them. Um, really, no decision is the very worst decision. You want them if they want to, if you've given them a quote, for them to accept that quote and want to work with you or not and give you feedback as to why. The worst thing they can do is sit on it and not make a decision. Um, and the worst, and that's worse for you because you don't know, you don't, you, you want that valuable feedback. Um, so basically choice we think is a good thing, but actually it paralyzes us. If we can make, help make, get people to make a choice and do it with as much ease as possible, then that's our goal. Okay, finally, uh, one of the things I think is useful in terms of understanding your customer is getting feedback. Um, this helps us understand our customer better and definitely deepens that customer relationship. Um, and it's a really good place to start, I think. If you have no idea really what your customers think of them, you should uh, think of you, you should ask, you should find out. So getting customer feedback is good. Here's a few tips. Um, you can learn to talk your customer's language. Um, you can use this, the testimonial they give you back um, in your copy, on your website, in your emails, and it helps reflect their language back in your, um, in your conversation. And you can use it to sort of add back into your, your customer persona. So it helps you refine that a little more. Um, and I also think that if people review you, it can reinforce their, um, their review, their opinion of you. It, also makes them more likely to refer you to others. So if they've positively endorsed you, they're much more likely to tell other people. Uh, same with negative um, as well. If, if people have a negative comment, then they're likely to tell other people about you as well. So you want it to be a positive, if at all possible. And remember that um, we uh, we offer Say Hola um, accounts to all of our um, coaching customers. It's a full Say Hola account. But if you aren't a coaching customer, you can get a free account, which gives you some of the basic but very, very fundamental um, ability to collect feedback from customers. And that's completely free. Just go to sayhola.co and sign up. Um, here are a couple of resources. I do recommend checking out the, not the last one, the Critical Path episode 156, a job to be done um, interview. It's 
worth listening to. Maybe if you want to uh, traveling to a client, put that on in the background, have a listen to it. It's uh, definitely worth it. It's got a lot of, it's interesting in terms of how they, uh, he asked questions of why he bought a car and really drilling into that a little bit. And maybe you can pick up some of those tips and use those when you're next speaking to customers in terms of drilling down into how they find you, why they use you and so on. Right, so finally, I want you to commit to an action, whether you're online or listening to this recorded, what are you gonna take from this and do over the next 30 days? Um, something I was thinking about actually while I was presenting this is actually, uh, we're redeveloping our website and I feel there's a much better way that we can approach um, our, our customers because we, I think we've got the life goal aspect to some, some sorted, but I don't think I'm doing enough for some people in terms of um, doing it for them. I think we do a lot in coaching. We've got a lot of free resources, we've got a lot of paid resources, but I don't do enough in saying we can do these things for you. You can outsource it to us. So not only can you achieve that same goal, but you don't need to do it. And so that's something I'm going to be looking into in, in terms of developing that. So that's my goal. That's what I'm going to commit to for the next 30 days is putting that into our new website. Um, we're actually running out of time on the Q&A and I don't see any questions in here. So I will, uh, I will leave that for the moment. Um, so we've got next topic. Which topic do we want to pick? Um, I've got a productivity masterclass. This is something I've been waiting to do for a while. Those of you who know me know I'm into getting things done, so I'd love to share more of that with you and some of my process. Um, also want to look into Google My Business. I know we've talked about search engine optimization, but I think it's probably worth, given some of the changes with Google recently or Google My Business, is that we talk about that more specifically. Um, I've done a great workshop on advertising essentials, so if you wanted to give me an easy ride, that's a good one. I'd love to um, show you. Or maybe if you want to dive behind how we do our podcasting, uh, I'm happy to talk more a little, a little bit more about that in terms of why we do that, what benefit we get from it, uh, and to just talk about the entire process. Uh, I think that should actually be quite a fun one. So um, I'm going to put a little poll out if I can find it on this list here. Topic for the next month. Let's see if this is the right one. Yeah. So I'll share that now and see uh, what we get. Otherwise, if you're not a club member, um, as I said, you know, we, we meet every month. It's all about motivation and keeping, uh, being consistent about what you do and getting support from people in the community. I'm always part of it as well. So um, certainly with our clubhouse, if there's any questions you've got in between sessions, you can, you can ask them in there of me or anyone else. It's only uh, £250 for 12 months. And if you use the code NEWBIE, that's N-E-W, I um, B I E N E W B I E, and you get 10% off that. Um, so do let other people know. I'm going to bring in an incentive scheme at some point, uh, probably next year, where any of the members we've already got, if you were to recommend other members, then we can give you a little something back as a thank you. So thanks very much. The next club session is on the 10th of December. Um, I brought it slightly further forward because. Christmas um, so uh, that actually won't be quite long so um, we'll, we'll get something ready for then uh, looks like Google my business is what people want to see so I will do that for next time so thank you very much for listening hopefully you found that useful and uh, do let me know once you've uh, if you're watching this live or you are watching in the recording uh, dip into clubhouse and let me know if there's any comments uh, on the particular message relevant to episode number 11 thanks very much guys and I'll see you next time